This episode is dedicated to the memory of Paul Ligurcio. Godspeed, my friend. Twenty-eight-year-old Lola Catherine Fry was in the midst of a massive change in her life. She quit her job, packed up her belongings, and moved out of Indianapolis, heading to live with her sister in Fort Wayne. She wanted to go back to school, put her life together, and begin fulfilling her dream of finding love and building her own family. One weekend in November of 1993, she made the drive back to Indianapolis to grab the last of her possessions. Hanging around her old stomping grounds, she visited family and ran into a few friends. She decided to attend a party at a local apartment rented by her then hairdresser. It was supposed to be a fun night, a sort of last hurrah, but it quickly turned tragic as no one ever heard from Kathy again after that night. The Indiana State Police kicked off their investigation and soon learned that something about the party that night simply didn't make sense. Over the years, they began to unravel the lies and deception, getting down to the dark and disturbing core. However, more than 30 years later, no one has ever been charged with a crime and neither Kathy nor her car have ever been found. This is Trace Evidence, Episode 238, The Vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. In today's episode, we will examine the mysterious 1993 disappearance of 28-year-old Lola Catherine Fry from Indianapolis, Indiana. Before jumping into the case, just a quick reminder that I will once again be representing Trace Evidence on Podcast Row at CrimeCon this year. CrimeCon takes place in Nashville, Tennessee on the weekend of May 31st through June 2nd. As always, I'm excited to meet and chat with all of you there. So if you're planning to attend and you haven't yet purchased your pass, use promo code TRACE to save 10%. That's crimecon.com promo code TRACE. I'm really looking forward to seeing you there. Kathy Fry planned to spend a few days visiting her family and hanging out with friends before finalizing her move to Fort Wayne. She never returned, and more than 30 years later, her family continues to seek answers and hope to find her and bring her home. This is episode 238, The Vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry. Lola Catherine Coleman was born on Saturday, February 20th, 1965, to parents Vernon and Delphia Dale Coleman. Lola was the Coleman's fifth child and fifth daughter and would grow up with four older sisters with a younger brother coming some years later to round out the family. For the most part, she'd be referred to by her middle name with friends and family calling her Kathy or Cat throughout the majority of her life. In her childhood, Kathy was very quiet with her sisters later describing her as shy and even timid. At the same time, she loved goofing and clowning around with her sisters. Oftentimes, she'd get into their mother's closet and throw on odd combinations of clothing, walking around the house like a fashion show runway, showing off different silly looks. According to Darlene, one of her sisters, Kathy was a girly girl who, like her sisters, loved dolls and dressing up. She would often play house with her siblings and their only clashes would arise when it came to the question of which one of them would get to play their mother. Kathy grew up in the city of Greenwood, located in Johnson County and along the southern rim of Indianapolis. She spent a great deal of time with her sisters, Kim, Laverne, Darlene, and Carol. In 1970, when Kathy was five years old, her parents welcomed their last child, a son named Christopher Daniel. According to the family, Kathy doted on her little brother from a young age and would later play a major role in helping to raise him. Kathy and her siblings would attend elementary school and middle school in Center Grove. She would then go on to attend Lawrence North High School where she would meet and fall in love with a young man named Martin Fry. Following the completion of her sophomore year, Kathy dropped out 
and later that year, the two would marry, moving to Texas. Kathy was happy with the arrangement, having always wanted to start a family of her own. However, the nomadic nature of being married to a man in the service didn't necessarily line up with Kathy's plans to build a family and settle down. Just a few years into the marriage, it became clear that things weren't going to work out, and the two officially divorced. Following the dissolution of the marriage, Kathy returned to Indiana and moved in with her parents. While the marriage hadn't worked out, she maintained her ex-husband's name and never changed it back, from that day forward being known legally as Lola Catherine Fry. In a sudden and shocking moment, the family's life was transformed when Kathy's mother suffered a massive stroke that ultimately rendered her paralyzed on the left side of her body. Kathy, along with her sister Laverne, took it upon themselves to step in and assist with all of the responsibilities that Dale was no longer capable of keeping up with. As a result, Kathy became extremely close with her younger brother, with the family later noting that she was more like a mother to him than a sister. She always looked out for him and made sure he was doing well. And whether she was working or busy otherwise, she always made time for family. She frequently dropped in to help out and would check in on everyone, and if she couldn't make it there in person, she'd call. According to the family, Kathy would call multiple times a day, and it was just the norm to hear her voice on their parents' answering machine. Her mother would later explain to the Daily Journal, saying, quote, Danny was 12. Kathy jumped in and took care of Danny. Kathy put her whole life on hold, plus took care of me. I don't see her going one day without calling me or Danny. I know if she was able, she would call us, end quote. By the early 90s, Kathy was in her mid-20s, and while she still dreamed of marrying and having a family, her previous experience left her somewhat gun-shy. Uncertain of what to do, Kathy ended up talking to her older sister, Laverne, who at the time was making good money working as an exotic dancer. Kathy had always been attractive, but at this time in her life, a lot of people referred to her as a beauty queen, frequently making references to her striking similarity to Hollywood starlet Morgan Fairchild. At first, it was a difficult decision for Kathy, who'd always been quiet, shy, and reserved. However, by this point in her life, she had come out of her shell and was much more lively, open, and socially involved. Her sister Darlene would later say on the Unfound podcast that Kathy had really come into herself and the quiet child she was had given way to a vibrant and confident woman. During this time, she grew close to her nieces and nephews who she treated as if they were her own kids. She frequently picked the kids up and took them out on adventures, whether it was playing mini golf, going to the movies, or just exploring the park. They loved their time with her and she cherished every moment she had with them. In a way, it was bittersweet. She had such strong motherly instincts and wanted so badly to have her own children, but she'd never get that chance. Working at different clubs and bars, Kathy would end up employed at P.T. Show Club located at 7916 Pendleton Pike in Indianapolis. P.T.'s describes itself as Indianapolis's number one rated strip club and at the time was owned by Bradley Dean Hurst, who owned multiple clubs in the area, including Brad's Gold Club and Brad's Brass Flamingo. According to Darlene, she was really surprised to see Kathy take to the stage, and later, when she asked her little sister how she'd found the courage to do it, Kathy had wryly admitted that she'd needed quite a few drinks before she dared climb on that stage for the first time. As time went on, Kathy became more comfortable, but the lifestyle of an exotic dancer wasn't exactly conducive to taking proper care of herself. Having been single for a while, Kathy ended up befriending one of the locals at PT's. John Riker was 15 years older than Kathy, and while he at first appeared to be a kind and caring man, their relationship would quickly transform into a nightmare. According to Darlene, she believed that Riker planned to dominate Kathy and try to keep her under his thumb. This was never going to work. Kathy wasn't the type to just submit to anyone's rule, and this led to multiple screaming arguments. Eventually, things turned physical, with Riker being violent towards the 28-year-old. Reportedly, he would show up at her job and threaten and assault her. 
Darlene stated on Unfound that there was one incident where Riker tried to drag Kathy out of the club, but was stopped by the bouncers. They then locked her in the office because they thought Riker was going to get a gun from his car to kill her. Reportedly, Riker was also friends with Brad Hurst, Kathy's boss, making it easy for him to gain access. Allegedly, Riker was aware that Hurst was planning to manipulate Kathy into making a very significant change. Standing 5 feet 3 inches tall and weighing approximately 120 pounds, Kathy had always maintained a rather petite frame. However, given the industry into which she'd gone to work, there was a lot of pressure for her and her co-workers to acquire certain enhancements. In the early 90s, breast implants weren't exactly a new thing, but the science was far from settled. Silicone implants were the preferred choice at the time, with the Dow Corning Company being on the forefront of developing the technology. Whether or not Kathy truly wanted breast implants is a question for which we have no answer, but it's been reported through multiple sources that her employers certainly pushed her and her coworkers towards having surgery, promising it would dramatically increase their income and self-esteem. Unfortunately, Kathy would end up suffering painful side effects due to what has been described as a botched job, and she wasn't alone. Several other dancers also had negative side effects from their breast implants becoming misshapen and causing chronic pain. In July of 92, Kathy and two of her fellow dancers, Renee Rowland and Sandra Bowman, filed a lawsuit alleging fraud and negligence. The suit targeted club owner Bradley Hurst and plastic surgeon Dr. Charles E. Hughes III. The suit alleged that Hurst had harassed and coerced the women into getting implants and that both he and Dr. Hughes had failed to properly warn the women about possible side effects. In addition to Hearst and Hughes, the suit also named two companies as defendants. The McGann Medical Corporation, a California-based company that manufactured the implants, as well as the Dow Corning Corporation, which produced the silicone. The women suffered from hardening of their breasts and painful buildup of scar tissue. Bowman ultimately had the implants removed, but Kathy and Roland couldn't afford to have surgery at the time. Lawyers Vernon Petrie and Richard Malad were trying to get the court to approve of a class action lawsuit, arguing that between 100 and 200 dancers had been pressured into getting the implants between Hearst's first two clubs in the previous three years. The lawyers also stated that the women were coerced into signing contracts about the implants, which essentially made them indentured servants. Hearst would pay for the implants, but with that came a cost. The contract specified that the dancers would not be allowed to work at any other clubs for two years. The contract specified that they could not work at clubs in Marion County, where Indianapolis is, or seven other surrounding counties. If a dancer quit or went elsewhere, they would then be required to pay back the cost of the implants. If you've ever watched The Sopranos, it sure sounds a hell of a lot like how Silvio ran his club, and it's usually not a good thing if your business is compared to that of a fictitious mobster, but I digress. The lawsuit went on to allege that the implants were dangerous and defective with a propensity to leak, break, and fall apart. The lawsuit further alleged that neither the women nor the physicians performing the procedures were adequately warned about the medical risks. In an extremely disturbing claim, the lawsuit also stated that Hearst employed someone at his clubs to perform a procedure they referred to as popping the scar tissue. This man would squeeze and manipulate the women's breasts in order to break up lumps which had appeared in the implants. Medically, this is a procedure known as enclosed capsulotomy and should only be performed by a medical professional, which this employee certainly was not. This ultimately was split into three separate lawsuits, one against Hearst, one against Hughes, and one against Dow Corning. Kathy gave depositions for the suits against Hearst and Dow Corning, but she wouldn't make it to her final deposition, scheduled to take place on Monday, November 15th, 1993. Instead, she would mysteriously disappear sometime between Saturday the 13th and Sunday the 14th. To this day, no one has ever said with any solid certainty 
when exactly Kathy was last seen alive. According to the family, Kathy suffered from chronic pain as the breast implants affected her skin, pulling it tightly and making even basic movements difficult to deal with. It was her sister, Darlene's belief, that the pain and trauma of the situation led to Kathy experimenting with drugs as she sought out a method by which to self-medicate her pain away. She felt trapped, and she wanted to get out. She'd grown tired of the lifestyle, sleeping all day and being up late into the night. She was tired of the clients, her boss, and feeling trapped inside of a world she no longer wished to be a part of. She made the first big step towards her freedom in the summer of 1993, when she finally split from her abusive boyfriend, John Riker. She also decided to get out of Indianapolis, making arrangements in September of 93 to move in with her sister, Laverne, in Fort Wayne, approximately 130 miles northeast of the city. Kathy was ready to put dancing in her past and informed Hearst that she quit. She wanted to go back to school, get a normal job, meet a nice guy, and settle down. She was in the middle of making her dreams a reality when she vanished. Kathy's move from the Lawrence area to Fort Wayne was a drop-by-drop process with her slowly moving her possessions from her apartment to Laverne's place. She'd pack her car, a red and black 1990 Mitsubishi Eclipse with the personalized license plate Lola, with as much as she could and drive it out to Fort Wayne. On Friday, November 12th, Kathy told her sister that she was going back to the Indianapolis area to visit family and to retrieve the last of her stuff. Just two weeks prior, their parents had moved into a new place in Fortville, located 25 miles northeast of Indianapolis, and Kathy wanted to check things out. According to Vernon and Dale, they had hoped that Kathy might consider moving in with them. According to Laverne, Kathy was in good spirits when she left, and she had taken with her enough clothes to last four or five days. She planned to return to Fort Wayne after the weekend. As far as anyone is aware, everything went fine that Friday, and Kathy was in touch with her parents during this time. The following day, Saturday, November 13th, Kathy called Laverne that afternoon from an Indianapolis tanning salon. The two chatted for a short period of time, and Kathy explained that she planned to make the drive back that night or maybe the next morning, Sunday the 14th. Laverne later stated that she advised Kathy to make the drive in the morning rather than making such a distance at night by herself. Kathy agreed, and the two said goodbye. This would be the last time anyone in the family would ever speak to Kathy. Sunday, the 14th, was the first day anyone realized something might be wrong. Kathy, who was in the habit of calling her parents three times a day, didn't ring their house even once. Back in Fort Wayne, Laverne was awaiting her sister's arrival, but as the day grew later and later, she became worried, wondering why Kathy hadn't shown up or at least called to explain why she was late. The family all coordinated in their efforts to try and locate Kathy, thinking that perhaps she had car trouble, had gotten sick, or worse yet, perhaps had been in an accident. Calls to local hospitals failed to turn up any sightings of the missing 28-year-old or her vehicle. Kathy's family next began making calls to friends, former co-workers, and anyone they could think of who might have seen Kathy, but again, were unable to turn over anyone who had seen her after the 13th. Finally, on Thursday, November 18th, Four days after Kathy was expected to return to Fort Wayne, Laverne picked up the phone and contacted the Fort Wayne Police Department to report her sister missing. The missing persons case would ultimately be taken over by the Indiana State Police, given that the investigation would involve Fort Wayne, Greenwood, Lawrence, and Indianapolis as a whole. While not conducting a full investigation themselves, The Fort Wayne Police Department did put out a be-on-the-lookout notice regarding Kathy and her vehicle, and they dispatched several units to look around for the missing woman, but no trace of her was found. Without any real solid evidence about what might have happened, the state police noted that there were no signs of foul play, and at least initially, it was just a missing persons case. Kathy's former employment as an exotic dancer would become a point of contention, where investigators considered it possible she could have been victimized by a former client or someone who had developed an obsession. The family, however, 
felt that the police weren't taking the case seriously and were rather dismissive of their concerns, primarily because of the types of jobs Kathy had worked. For the family, they quickly became aware that investigators didn't seem to consider Kathy a top priority and carried an air almost as though it was her own fault for being involved with that side of society. Investigators began interviewing friends and family in an attempt to gather additional information. They entered Kathy's details and description into national crime computers. They put out a nationwide bolo for her vehicle, listing its description, license plate, and additional information that they hoped might lead to a sighting. The car was one of the sticking points for investigators who noted that in the vast majority of missing persons cases, the vehicles recovered without issue. Given the legal issues pending and the fact that Kathy had missed her scheduled deposition for Monday the 15th, detectives went and interviewed both Brad Hurst and Dr. Charles Hughes, neither of whom reported possessing any knowledge of Kathy's whereabouts. Following the disappearance, Hughes would countersue Kathy, who could not defend herself. Ultimately, the lawsuit would be dropped when the two other plaintiffs agreed to settle. Reportedly, Bowman and Roland took very low settlements because they feared that if they continued on, they too might disappear. Police would later note that they did not consider Hearst or Hughes to be suspects in the case, and they did not continue to pursue either individual as being connected to the disappearance. The next person they turned to was Kathy's former boyfriend, John Riker, who reportedly had plans to get together with the missing woman the Saturday she was last seen. During initial interviews, Riker confirmed that he had in fact spent the night with Kathy. According to him, he was going to pick her up and together they'd attend a party in North Indianapolis. Now, for reasons passing understanding, Riker states that Kathy drove to the site of a former Chi Chi's restaurant, then located at 867 U.S. Highway 31 North, and parked her car there, planning to leave it there while they attended the party. Curiously, Riker at the time lived at 461 Creekview Court, less than three miles west of the restaurant. Why exactly Kathy didn't leave her car at his house since he was driving her to the party has never been explained by anyone. After picking up Kathy, presumably from the restaurant parking lot, the two proceeded north to 4430 Brookline Court, the location of the Williamsburg North Apartments. The apartment was then owned by Joe Schaefer, who knew Kathy by way of the fact that he was both her and her mother's hairdresser. Also present was his boyfriend, Steve Chafee, his brother, Tim Schaefer, with his boyfriend, Samuel, and their other brother, Jeff Schaefer. According to Riker, the group hung out together, had some drinks, did some drugs, and then went out to hit the local clubs for dancing and fun. Riker then claimed that after leaving the party sometime between 3 and 5 a.m., he and Kathy went back to the restaurant parking lot where she got in her car and followed him the three miles to his Greenwood home. Riker told police that Kathy went to sleep on his couch and he went to bed. He was allegedly awakened by a phone call at approximately 6 a.m. from one of his employees. Riker showered and left the house at 7.30 a.m. to let his employee into a local business to which he had the keys. Returning around an hour later at 8.30, Riker stated that both Kathy and her car were gone, and he assumed that she had begun the drive back to Fort Wayne. Investigators at the time weren't sure what to make of the account, as on the one hand, they had no information to contradict it, but on the other, it didn't really make sense to them. As a result, Police would make requests to search both Riker's home and his business, as well as asking him to come in for a polygraph examination. Neither of the searches yielded any evidence or information that would have tied Riker to the disappearance. The lie detector test took place on Monday, November 29th, and was reportedly inconclusive. However, during her interview on Unfound, Kathy's sister Darlene stated that Riker had failed the test on the 29th as well as two additional tests conducted later. She alleged that the two questions Riker continued to fail on were, did you do something to Lola Catherine Fry? And did you kill Lola Catherine Fry? 
In order to follow up on Riker's claims about the party, police tracked down and interviewed each of the other men reported to have been present. They told a story consistent with Riker's, saying that they had partied at the apartment, went clubbing, and then went back to the apartment before heading home separately. Police began to wonder if something untoward might have occurred at the party, but none of the attendees had any additional information to provide. From there, if Riker's story was true, they were left wondering if something might have happened to Kathy along the 140 miles between his Greenwood home and Laverne's place in Fort Wayne. However, they had no real area to search or specific details to run down. From this point forward, the case starts to grow cold as investigators find themselves with little to work with. Turning to the media, they report on Kathy's disappearance and provide photos of her as well as her car, at which time they requested assistance from the public. The family, for their part, launched their own searches, produced flyers, and did the best they could to paper the area with information about their missing sibling and daughter. Curiously, Darlene noted, neither she nor the family were ever contacted by John Riker or anyone else who offered to help search or provide support or information. According to her, the one time Riker did speak to the family, he told them the same story about Kathy being gone when he woke up on the morning of the 14th, and none of them believed it either. Sergeant Ron Bruce of the state police was the first investigator put in charge of Kathy's case, and less than a month after she was reported missing, in December of 1993, he explained to the Daily Journal, quote, This was a very, very close family, and for her to miss it was very unusual. We don't have any reason to suspect foul play, except that she called her family almost daily and hasn't done so for three weeks now, end quote. Bruce went on to state that investigators had received a ton of calls since the story was put into the papers, many of which were people who alleged to have seen Kathy's vehicle in the days and hours following her disappearance. While there were no solid signs of foul play, over the course of the next few months, there were several details that caught the attention of detectives. First and foremost, no one in the family ever heard from Kathy again after Saturday, November 13th. The 28-year-old, who was extremely close with her family, then went on to miss both Thanksgiving and Christmas, major holidays for the tight-knit group. In addition, police noted that $1,500 left behind in Kathy's bank account was untouched. Her license plate expired and was not renewed, and no payments were made on her car following the 13th. A few months after her disappearance, Kathy's driver's license was suspended, when she failed to pay off a ticket she had received the weekend before she disappeared. Sergeant Bruce stated that it was very out of character and extremely odd, saying, quote, it's like she vanished. We haven't ever found her or her car. It's just a mystery, end quote. The lack of solid evidence did little to dissuade the family, who firmly believed that Kathy had been the victim of foul play. In an attempt to do more, Laverne quit her job and devoted all of her free time to working on the case, which was haunting the family. Carol, another of Kathy's sisters, was disturbed by powerful recurring nightmares. Darlene and Laverne worked the case from their own ends, trying to bring more awareness and to get police to dig deeper. The more time passed, the less they felt investigators actually cared about Kathy's disappearance. For Kathy's parents, it was extremely difficult. Vernon was crushed by his daughter's absence and started getting money together for the hiring of private investigators. He was of the belief that if the case was going to be solved, they would need help outside of the state police who he didn't think were doing much. Despite the urgency of the family and their continued drive to keep the case alive, it continued to grow cold. 1993 came to an end without answers. The year of 1994 came and went with little developments and the passage of one year since Kathy had been seen, with no changes in the case. In the summer of 1995, a year and a half after the disappearance, the family expressed their frustration to the media, with Dale exclaiming, quote, I just don't understand why something hasn't showed. They can't find any sign of Kathy. They can't find the car. They can't find anything. I don't understand how they can find all these other women and not find Kathy, 
end quote. Dale explained how painful the whole situation was, made worse by the fact that every time an unknown woman's body was found in the state, she and her family would be contacted to make a potential identification. It never turned out to be Kathy, but they had to go through that nightmarish possibility each and every time. Asked where the case stood nearly two years later, Sergeant Ron Bruce explained that they hadn't made a great deal of progress. He said that he had heard from the family multiple times a week and that he encouraged the contact, but he had nothing new to offer them. According to Bruce, they were always checking to see if Kathy or her car turned up anywhere, but they never did. That led to the belief that if foul play were involved, she and the car were probably in the same place. He theorized it was possible that they could have been dumped into one of the various stone quarries in the area, noting that some were 60 to 70 feet deep. Bruce, a former diver for the state police, explained that it was extremely difficult to search such areas as you couldn't see beyond a foot or so in the water. He explained, quote, You can't see a car on the bottom from the air. It's kind of at a standstill. There's no new leads, no new information to pursue. There is no evidence of foul play. The family, I guess, has just got to hold out hope. End quote. Unfortunately, the case would continue cooling, and by October of 95, Bruce was mostly resigned to the fact that unless new evidence or information surfaced, they were unlikely to find any answers. He would explain to the Daily Journal, saying, quote, the information we have, she had left her former boyfriend's house en route to her sister's house in Fort Wayne. We don't have any evidence to indicate that this was foul play. Basically, what we've got is a missing person. We've pursued this mainly because Lola was so close to her family. She called her mother or some other family member every day. It was quite a break in pattern when she didn't call. We're still working on it and following the leads, but to be honest, it's almost down to nothing, end quote. Following this interview and the buzz it stirred up, the state police received several calls from witnesses who claimed to have seen Kathy's car with its distinctive Lola license plate following her disappearance. Some callers claimed to have seen the car on Interstate 69 in the area of Castleton, approximately four miles northeast from the Williamsburg North Apartments where the party had been held. Another caller claimed to have seen the car parked at a nursing home downtown, and while police followed up on these tips, they could not track down the vehicle. Sadly, this is how the case would remain for years, until one call in 1999 seemed to change everything. Checking in on the case after not having heard from investigators for a while, Laverne contacted the state police, at which time she was informed that no investigator was then assigned to the case. Blown away and heartbroken over this, the family expressed their anger and frustration to investigators as well as in local papers. They began hosting fundraisers and events so that they could offer a reward, pay private investigators, produce more flyers, and purchase ad space. Kathy's father, Vernon, expressed his lack of confidence in the investigators, telling the Indianapolis Star, quote, we have to believe she may still be alive. I have to have hope. The state police, they've been looking since 1993. I really don't think the state police is very good. End quote. Following Laverne's call, Indiana State Police First Sergeant Stoney Van volunteered to take over the case, saying that he remembered investigators discussing it years earlier when it was still active. According to the family, Sergeant Van moved extremely quickly when he took over, and in a matter of just weeks, he'd learned vastly more information than had previously been acquired. Laverne would later state, quote, Once we started asking questions, pushing, something happened. And I don't know how, but all of a sudden, Detective Van knew a lot in a short time. End quote. While they were happy to see advancements in the case, the family couldn't help but feel that if perhaps the original investigators had taken the case seriously, they might not have had to wait six years to learn what had likely happened to Kathy. Sergeant Van eventually reached out to the family and called them into his office where he wanted to share what he had learned. When he first took over the case, 
Van had to essentially redo all of the initial investigation, and unsurprisingly, he quickly found that all of the available information pointed towards Kathy's disappearance being connected to that party she attended. Hoping that the passage of seven years might have changed things or at least altered perspectives, Sergeant Van began the process of tracking down and re-interviewing everyone who had attended the party at the Williamsburg North Apartments. Somewhat to his surprise, two of the men present dramatically changed their stories from what they had told original investigators back in 93. The new details delivered by these men completely changed detectives' views of the case. According to the witnesses, arriving at the apartment for the party that night, they drank alcohol, smoked marijuana, and even indulged in prescription pills. In her interview with Unfound, Darlene stated that she had been told that one of the attendees, Jeff Schaefer, had arrived at the party with what was described as a mountain of cocaine. According to the interviews, the whole group went out to a bar right around the corner from the apartment complex and were having a good time when things took a bad turn. An argument broke out between Kathy and John Riker, leading to him slapping her across the face. At this point, Joe Schaefer, his boyfriend Steve, Tim Schaefer, and his boyfriend Sam decided to leave the bar and head down to a popular gay club in the 700 block of Massachusetts Avenue, approximately eight miles from the apartment. This left Kathy in the company of only John Riker and Jeff Schaefer. The four men returned from Massachusetts Avenue back to Joe Schaefer's apartment in the early morning hours, and from this point forward, their stories all have slight differences. Some of the men told Sergeant Van that Kathy appeared to have suffered from some kind of a medical emergency at the apartment and then fell unconscious, at which time she was carried out and placed inside of John Riker's car. Riker denies this to this day. Two of the men present would go on to tell Sergeant Van that Kathy had passed out in the bathroom, likely from a drug overdose. One man claimed Kathy had entered the bathroom and then they'd heard the sound of her falling to the floor, while another man stated that he saw Kathy lying in the shower where John Riker was spraying her with water and trying to wake her up. Without waking, she was wrapped in a blanket with only her hair and toes sticking out from either end. She was then carried into the living room where the group of men present made an agreement to never discuss what happened that night. At that point, Allegedly, John Riker and Jeff Schaefer carried Kathy to Riker's car and drove away. Schaefer returned to the apartment approximately two hours later without Riker or Kathy. According to some of the men present, it seemed apparent that Kathy had likely overdosed. Whether or not this was accidental or if there was foul play involved was unknown. However, they also confirmed that none of them had checked for a pulse or ensured Kathy was alive before she was taken out of the apartment. Where she was taken and what happened to her after that can only be known by John Riker, Jeff Schaefer, or both. Confronted with this information, Riker stuck to his original story, saying that Kathy was alive and awake when they left the party, that he took her home, and that her and her car disappeared while he was on a work call the next morning. The entire scenario was suspect. While it was known that Kathy had indulged in drug use and that the people she was partying with that night weren't exactly on the straight and narrow path, Investigator Van couldn't help but wonder if indeed this was an accidental overdose, why would they have not have taken her to a hospital? They could have easily dumped her at an emergency room and then left without providing any information about themselves or being connected. They could have taken her anywhere and called 911 to get her assistance and left her there. Given that none of this happened, Kathy's family is of the belief that she was dead when they took her out of the apartment wrapped in that blanket. Investigators, while unable to say so with any certainty, tend to agree, though without additional evidence and information, they will not comment on their running theory of what happened that night. Faced with this new information, it essentially confirmed what the family had thought for years that Kathy never disappeared and was dead sometime between the late night hours of the 13th and the early morning hours of the 14th. They never believed Riker's story, and they thought it was much more likely that she either died accidentally 
or was perhaps purposefully made to ingest an overdose. Laverne would later note that regardless of the how and the why, they wanted to bring her home and give her a proper burial, saying, quote, Kathy's dead, and I want to know where her body's at. I want her to know we never gave up looking for her, end quote. On the morning of September 25th, 2000, Sergeant Van obtained a search warrant for John Riker's Greenwood home, the place where Kathy was allegedly last seen alive. The affidavit for the warrant specified that after attending a party with Riker on the 13th, Kathy had either fallen unconscious or died. Searches were conducted in Marion County, where the apartment was at which the party had been held, and also where Riker's business was located, as well as Johnson County, where Riker lived, and Bartholomew County, where Jeff Schaefer then lived in a home located in the town of Hope, a part of Haw Creek Township. Evidence acquired by Sergeant Van suggested that John Riker was the last person to see Kathy and that corroborating witnesses placed Jeff Schaefer as the man who had helped carry her body to the car, who then left with Riker. Van later stated that several articles had been gathered at the locations when they had done these searches and that they had been sent out to the lab to determine whether or not they had blood on them. If indeed that was ever determined, the state police have never said. In addition to the searches of the homes and businesses, police also searched several bodies of water. They utilized cadaver dogs in the homes, as well as the bodies of water and in at least one field, but they never managed to find anything. Sergeant Van would later note that without a body, it would be difficult for them to move forward. While the investigation remained open, they needed more to be able to file any kind of charges. In hopes of obtaining information, several people were apparently called to testify before a grand jury. One of these people, according to Darlene, was Tim Schaefer. She stated on Unfound that Tim Schaefer allegedly, while traveling to the grand jury with his father, told him that he was afraid he would be going away for a long time. Reportedly, following the grand jury, no indictments were handed out because none of the people who testified could confirm that Kathy was dead when she had been removed from the apartment. The whole situation was bizarre, as Sergeant Van pointed out. Were this a case of an accidental overdose, there would likely be no crime to prosecute and no charges to file. They might have been able to charge some or all of the men with improper disposal of a body or even theft of a vehicle, but the statute of limitations has since passed on both of these crimes and still no one has been willing to come forward with information. Sergeant Van went on to note that unless Kathy's body is recovered and there are obvious signs of homicide, there is no likelihood that anyone would face any charges. This only makes things worse for the family who feel at this point in time that the information they need to bring Kathy home is being withheld from them only to torture them and make it that much more painful. Darlene would later tell the Daily Journal, quote, Picture if it was your sister or brother or daughter. Could you leave them lying out there? Even though they're dead, you still need to find them. You want to rescue them, to have a proper burial, to say goodbye. End quote. Darlene and the family continued to push for more investigating, additional searches, anything they could to keep the case alive. In 2002, Marion County Prosecutor Scott Newman met with investigators to discuss the case. In a letter written to Darlene, Newman explained why charges would not be filed. He wrote, in part, quote, I agree with their assessment that, regrettably, all leads available at present have been pursued and we are no closer to finding Lola or having a case against the person who either killed her and or disposed of her body and vehicle. This pains all of us who pride ourselves on leaving no stone unturned. But none of us can even imagine the pain you must feel of loss compounded by uncertainty. I wish there were more I could say, but all were in agreement, though we will always be prepared to go after new information. End quote. A little over a year later, on Friday, June 6, 2003, Lake County Sheriff's Captain Hank Waronka who served dual duty as the operator of Aquatics Recovery and Rescue, 
brought his divers out to a property in the 4,000 block of Wicker Road. Located in Perry Township, Wicker Road is southwest from downtown Indianapolis, and there are multiple lakes in the area. Darlene later told reporters that she had been directed towards the site by a member of law enforcement who didn't want to get directly involved with the case. She explained, quote, We were told to go there and dive by a state police officer who didn't want to get involved. It was Hank who found the witness who saw someone digging in the field early in the morning, end quote. The divers searched in Marion County, the location of Perry Township, free of charge for Darlene. While they didn't find anything of interest beneath the water, the tip about someone digging in the area would not be ignored. Four months later, in October of 2003, the Indiana State Police returned and conducted a series of interviews with neighbors in the area of Wicker Road. Though police would not specify for whom they were searching, they did tell the media they were potentially looking for more than one body. During the search, they used bulldozers, a backhoe, and cadaver dogs. They also used ground-penetrating radar lent to them from the Indiana Geological Survey. No warrant was necessary for the search, as the property had since changed hands, and the new owner told investigators they could search whatever they needed to. Sergeant Steve Stiletovich of the state police told reporters they had been drawn to the area by tips, and that their search was targeting the location of people reported missing in the previous five years. Shannon Rayanne Turner had gone missing from Indianapolis on Thursday, December 4th, 1997, just over four years after Kathy. Turner had been engaged in a relationship with David Mays, a known enforcer and member of the Outlaws biker gang. In 2002, Mays was charged with Turner's murder, despite the fact that investigators to this day have never recovered her body. However, many believe there could potentially be a link between Turner's disappearance and Kathy's, since both women had been employed as exotic dancers in the Indianapolis area. The search, conducted on Friday, October 17th, did not result in the discovery of any remains, but it did kick off a strange event. Larry Lee Ballard, who once lived in the 4,000 block of Wicker Road, was serving a 10-year sentence for conspiracy to possess and distribute methamphetamine to the outlaws. He was, at the time, serving his sentence at a Manchester, Kentucky prison camp. Reportedly, the prison camp was very lax, and most inmates described it as more of a summer camp than a prison. This fact made what happened all the more curious. Just two days after searching began, Ballard escaped from the prison camp and went on the run. On Friday, October 31st, Ballard was arrested outside of Martinsville at a friend's home in rural Morgan County. Kathy's family, along with Shannon's, wondered what could have made a guy like Ballard, who was arguably serving easy time, want to risk being given more time and a likely transfer to a more secure correctional institution by escaping. It seemed highly likely that he was under the belief investigators might find something on his former property that could net him a long, long sentence. When police had initially gone to the area to interview neighbors, they had contacted the prison camp and requested that Ballard be placed in solitary confinement so he wouldn't learn of their plans. However, once he was let out, he seemed to have discovered the truth pretty quickly and decided to hit the road. Unfortunately, nothing major was discovered in connection with Ballard's escape, recapture, or the excavation and dives conducted in the area. This, of course, resulted in a lot of pain and frustration for Kathy's family, who had gotten to their wit's end with the state police, who they believed simply weren't doing enough. Sergeant Van noted that part of the reason he had directed a search in the area was because he'd received a tip that Kathy might have had some connection to the outlaws, though what that connection was has never been established publicly. In November of 2003, which marked 10 years since Kathy had last been seen, the family made it very clear they were beyond frustrated with the work, or lack thereof, of the state police. Sergeant Van, asked about their frustration, replied, quote, At times... They have felt I was a great detective, and other times they have raked me over the coals 
and have caused me to justify my work to the state police superintendent, prosecutor, the whole nine yards, end quote. Strangely, in the same interview, Van says, quote, we are accused of one-way communication. They say, we don't get to see what he's got, and they never will. We don't do that. I will go where the investigation points, where the investigation leads me. I will follow any lead until it can't be followed anymore, end quote. Seemingly, he argues that he's willing to do whatever it takes to solve the case, but then he qualifies it curiously, saying that while he'll follow any lead until it can't be followed anymore, he won't just follow any lead. Saying of the family, quote, I'm not going to run around blind and let them lead me by the nose and be their private investigator. End quote. Kathy's family began urging the state police to turn the case over to another agency, perhaps one with more success and skill investigating cold cases but the state police were not interested in doing that. It seems an odd choice to cling tightly to the case, especially when the guy who was the lead investigator for the longest time, Sergeant Van, appears to have some kind of a personal conflict with the family after all those years of failed attempts. Darlene replied to Van's statements, saying no one in the family was trying to lead them around, and they certainly hadn't demanded their files. She explained, quote, where is the advocate from the police to our family? We are not asking for investigators' notes. We just want to know what's been done. End quote. In May of 2004, the Johnson County Dive Team, made up of eight Johnson County Sheriff's deputies, were asked by the family to conduct an underwater search at the Eagle Trace Retention Pond just off Olive Branch Road, which is located as the crow flies, two miles south of the former home of John Riker. The pond was noted as being approximately 12 feet deep and with almost zero visibility. Divers managed to recover a 1990 Chevy pickup truck from the bottom. It had been reported missing in 1996, so they were fairly certain it had no connection to Kathy. They also found and pulled up a 300-gallon oil tank, but upon further examination, there were no remains inside. Unfortunately, it was another dead end, but the family were grateful for the Johnson County divers' assistance. One of the last major searches for Kathy took place in 2005, 12 years after her disappearance and nearly 20 years ago today. Two of the men who had been present at the party when Kathy was last seen had passed away over the ensuing years. Brothers Joe and Jeff Schaefer were gone, with Jeff passing in October of 2005 at the age of 46. For many years, Jeff had lived on a property off East Country Road in close proximity to Schaefer Lake, which was owned by a consortium of his relatives. Darlene learned that police had previously been in the area searching for Kathy, and so she decided to take a look for herself. Upon visiting, a neighbor informed her that Jeff had died and that while police had been in the area years earlier, they hadn't searched the home and they had missed a few of the nearby ponds. Approaching the home, Darlene met the new owners who were Mennonites. After explaining the circumstances, they invited Darlene into the home and told her they would be more than happy to allow her to search the house and whatever surrounding land they had access to. As it turned out, when the home was purchased, much of the surrounding property was kept by the Schaefer estate. Regardless, the owner showed Darlene something he had always found odd. Jeff Schaefer had dug through the floor of the kitchen and constructed his own cellar. As soon as she saw it, Darlene said on Unfound, she assumed that her sister's body had been kept in that place until it was later dumped or buried elsewhere. Ground-penetrating radar was brought to the house along with a cadaver dog. The radar struck a point in the yard where an anomaly was spotted, while the dog indicated that something might be beneath a concrete pad supporting the back porch. Not wanting to impose on the family, Darlene made the choice to have them dig where the radar had gone off, and at the end of the day, it turned out to be nothing. To this day, Darlene said she regrets not also ripping up the back porch and digging beneath it. However, in the years since, the home has come under new ownership, and when Darlene inquired about digging, the owner made it clear that he wasn't about to have his back porch.
porch torn apart. In 2013, Kathy's case was added to a set of Indiana cold case playing cards to be distributed into the prison system in hopes of getting new tips or leads. For the family, however, they believe the answers are most likely to be found at the bottom of a lake on private property, that being Schaefer Lake. Reportedly, since the lake is owned by multiple people, they all must agree to allow investigators to conduct a search, and that has never happened. Whether or not Schaefer Lake holds the answers, or if it would just be another fruitless, heartbreaking search, remains unknown. When last seen, Lola Catherine Coleman Fry was described as being a white female with brown hair and green eyes standing 5 feet 5 inches tall and weighing approximately 120 pounds. Though her name is Lola, she typically went by Kathy, Catherine, or Cat. Kathy has a scar on her right knee, a small scar on her forehead, and breast implants. She also went missing with her car, a red and black 1990 Mitsubishi Eclipse bearing the personalized license plate, Lola. Kathy was last known to be present at a party at the Williamsburg North Apartments, 4430 Brookline Court in Northeast Indianapolis on the evening of Saturday, November 13th, 1993. Also present at the party were her ex-boyfriend, John Riker, Tim Schaefer, Steve Chafee, Joe Schaefer, now deceased, and Jeff Schaefer, also deceased. Kathy was 28 years old at the time of her disappearance and, if alive today, would now be 59 years old. To date, none of the living attendees of the party have come forward to offer up new information that might help the family to finally locate the remains of their beloved daughter, aunt, and sister. Kathy's disappearance had devastating effects on her family. While some sisters put their lives on hold to try and search for her, other siblings struggled to confront the harsh reality, suffering from panic and endless nightmares. Kathy's father, Vernon, desperate to find answers, was taken advantage of by so-called psychics and sensitives who claim to possess answers only to give vague details that grow more complex with each new check. In 2000, seven years after the disappearance, Vernon and Dale divorced, the loss of their daughter becoming an unstoppable pain they could no longer tolerate. Dale would ultimately move to Mississippi, where she remarried and was granted a second shot at a happy life, but nothing could ever fill the void left by Kathy. Both Vernon and Dale prayed to bring their daughter home to find the truth before their days on this planet came to an end. Tragically, both have since passed without ever seeing a conclusion. This November will mark 31 years since Kathy Fry mysteriously vanished after heading out to a party in Northeast Indianapolis. Despite countless searches, thousands upon thousands of flyers, coverage in newspapers and on television, podcasts, and even unsolved mysteries, not a single trace of the 28-year-old has ever been found. Her family continues to hope that someday they will be granted the ability to bring her home so she might receive a proper burial. They now carry the burden that laid heavily upon their parents' shoulders as they know that, without them, Kathy's story will just fade from memory. Asked about the case all these years later, Darlene replied, quote, When someone dies, you grieve it and mourn it and live with the hole in your heart. But with this, there is no closure. You don't go on because if you go on, Nobody cares. So if we forget, then she is forgotten. The vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry is an extremely frustrating case in that it seems like we kind of know what happened. It seems apparent to almost anyone who's ever looked into this case that something happened at that party that Saturday night in November of 93. However, outside of the people who were present that night, no one can say anything with any certainty. Over the years, a handful of different possibilities have been raised. She was killed at the party or overdosed and was disposed of, 
Or maybe it had something to do with the lawsuit she had going. Or maybe it was connected to a biker gang in the area known for violent reprisals and drug running. The one theory that we can almost certainly dismiss out of hand is the one presented by John Riker. That he came home in the morning and noticed Kathy and her car were gone and he simply assumed she'd driven back to Fort Wayne. That's the one theory for which there's the least amount of evidence. Being that there are a few different theories, arguably with branching narratives that might intersect, I figured on tackling those on the outskirts and then working my way in from what is possible to what's most likely. The first place to begin, I think, is with the alleged connection between Kathy and the Outlaws biker gang. When Shannon Turner went missing in December of 1997, investigators had pretty good reasons to assume her disappearance might be connected to the gang. Turner was in a relationship with David Mays, a dangerous member of the gang who was known as an enforcer. Just prior to Thanksgiving, they got engaged. However, they missed an early December appointment to apply for their marriage license, and reportedly it was because Turner didn't want to be in the relationship at all anymore. The last time anyone in Turner's family heard from her was on December 1st. She never came home for Christmas, as she always did, and she's never been seen again. The last time she was seen, she was leaving her job at Babe's Showgirls West on Lafayette Road. At the time, her car was being worked on, so David Mays was picking her up from work. She never made it home on the 4th and has never been heard from again. Investigators ultimately charged Mays with Turner's murder five years after she vanished in 2002. He'd go on to be acquitted of all charges, with the prosecution believing that their inability to recover her body had led to that acquittal. I can totally understand why someone would believe that Mays was involved in Turner's disappearance and likely murder. He's a violent criminal with a long rap sheet. They were in a relationship and apparently on extremely opposite ends with him wanting to get married and her wanting to break up. There's enough there to make a connection, and with Mays being one of the last people to see Turner alive, it doesn't take a seasoned investigator to follow the thread here. However, they've never found any solid physical evidence. They did major searches along Wicker Road, but found no trace of Turner or Kathy, and I think Kathy is somewhat of a mystery here. At no point have I seen much of anything to link Kathy to David Mays, Larry Ballard, or anyone associated with the outlaws. It appears the only real similarities here are the fact that both Turner and Kathy worked as exotic dancers. I suppose it's also worth noting that Kathy never worked at the club where Turner was employed, and the majority of Kathy's time was spent in South and East Indianapolis, while Turner's club was Northwest. Sure, they could have interacted or had mutual connections, but no one's ever established any link. It doesn't sound like any of their friends have had any reason to associate them together. And purely, the one thing they really have in common is that they were exotic dancers who disappeared in Indianapolis where the state police apparently don't care much about cases like that. Moving our attention away from the outlaws, the next theory that many have linked Kathy to is that her disappearance was directly related to her lawsuits against Dow Corning, Brad Hurst, and Dr. Charles Hughes. Now. I think I should note, several people who have been alleged to have had negative connections to Kathy have died, and Dr. Hughes is the most recent, passing away following a battle with Parkinson's in November of 2023, 30 years and four days after Kathy was last seen. Eerie coincidences aside, the theory kind of goes like this. Supposedly, Brad Hurst would coerce his employees into getting breast implants, for which he would pay so long as they signed on to be his exclusive dancers for two years. Hughes, a plastic surgeon, would then be involved in the surgeries. When things went sideways, Kathy was among three women who filed lawsuits. Those suits targeted Hearst, Hughes, and the Dow Corning Corporation. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Kathy had already given her deposition in regard to Hearst and Dow Corning. She was scheduled to give her deposition against Hughes on Monday the 15th, but as we all know, she never made it to court. Now, in her interview on Unfound, Darlene hinted that maybe Kathy had to be gotten rid of 
because Hughes might have been involved in an insurance scam in which he would bill insurance companies for procedures previously paid for or never even conducted, and the patients would get a cut by going along with it. Seemingly, it would be argued that Hughes wanted Kathy eliminated so no one would ever pick up on this, but the problem is, even with Kathy gone, this information still made it out. Now, it's worth noting that there don't appear to have ever been any charges or legal issues for Hughes stemming from this. It seems likely that if he were pulling off some major scam, raking in cash and getting involved in potential homicides, someone from law enforcement would have put it together. At the same time, there were allegedly some issues regarding law enforcement crossing lines when it came to exotic dancers in Indianapolis. Indiana has what are known as state excise police, who are essentially an arm of the Indiana Alcohol and Tobacco Commission. While legit law enforcement, they focus mostly on areas related to the sale and consumption of alcohol and tobacco. Allegedly, throughout the early 1990s, it was a known secret that some of these officers were engaging in sexual activity at the strip clubs, including one supposedly owned by Brad Hurst, and that this was going on even when Kathy worked there. Now, no major information has seemingly ever been released here, but the speculation has been that perhaps some of these officers were willing to look the other way on law violations in exchange for sexual favors from the dancers who arguably weren't volunteering for the job. Whether or not this is true, I can't confirm, though I will say it certainly doesn't look good. How could Kathy's family believe she'd get a full and thorough investigation if members of law enforcement were on the take from her boss, one of the men alleged to have had good reason to want to see her disappear. Without additional follow-up, it's hard to know for certain, but there's clearly some kind of treasure trove of corruption and twisted morals to be found were one to dig down deep enough into this. I don't have a hard time imagining that Dr. Hughes probably wasn't all that devastated when Kathy failed to show up to give her deposition, and apparently he wasn't bothered when she completely disappeared. At the same time, no one can confirm whether or not Hughes would have viewed this as something massive enough to commit murder over. Remember, there were two other dancers also involved in these lawsuits, so eliminating Kathy wouldn't necessarily have put an end to any of the inquiries. At the same time, Darlene did state that one of the lawyers working for Kathy told her and her family directly that he completely believed Hughes and Hurst were involved in Kathy's disappearance. Whether or not he possessed evidence or if this was purely instinct or suspicion has never been clarified. Regardless, things get a little strange here. It's suggested that if Kathy died at the party on Saturday the 13th, that it might actually have been a homicide carried out at the behest of Hearst and Hughes. That, at least to me at this point, feels like a bit of a stretch. You've got this 28-year-old who's 5'5", five 120 pounds. You want her eliminated, and your best plan is to invite her to a party where there are going to be additional witnesses, and then you'll encourage her to do drugs until she overdoses, or maybe you spike the drugs and, or force her to ingest them. Sure, that's possible, but there's a part of me that thinks it would have been a lot easier to do almost anything else. It's stated multiple times that John Riker was a regular at Hearst Clubs, and that's how he and Kathy became linked. It's said that he was friends with Hearst and Hughes, and likely had knowledge of the breast implant scam. So, some have theorized that Riker was asked to eliminate the problem for them, and since he and Kathy had broken up, he wanted some revenge for himself too. The problem I have with this is simple. Kathy gets into Riker's car, and he drives her to the apartment complex for the party. Well, you've already got her in the car, and she's already agreed to go to the party with you. I don't know why if you were planning to kill her, you'd actually take her there. Wouldn't it be easier to just drive her out into the middle of nowhere and commit the crime? Or, once she agrees with your plans, to make arrangements to drive her into an ambush? It seems like a lot of steps and dancing around when if they had all conspired to kill her, there were much easier ways to accomplish this. Whether or not Hughes or Hearst were involved, we may never know. 
Despite the claims, the allegations, and all the rest, there's never been any solid evidence to link either of them to the crime. Were they involved in unsavory practices? Did they prey on those that they could take advantage of and then lock them into barbaric contracts? It seems to be the case, but as far as I can tell from my own work, I couldn't find a link between Hearst or Hughes to any violent crimes or situations even remotely bordering on homicide. Scumbags are going to scumbag, but that doesn't necessarily make them murderers. They may have benefited financially and legally from Kathy's disappearance, But the truth of it is, I can't place either of them at the apartment party and every witness, every piece of evidence, every solid theory points to that apartment party. So let's dig into that party and the attendees and see what, if any, connections can be made. According to the story told by John Riker to police, Kathy parked her red and black Mitsubishi Eclipse in the parking lot of a then Chi-Chi's restaurant located at 867 U.S. Highway 31 North approximately three miles from his home at 461 Creekview Court in Greenwood. He then picked Kathy up, and the two made the trip north to the Williamsburg North Apartments, 4430 Brookline Court. At the time, the apartment was rented by Joe Schaefer, who was both Kathy and her mother's hairdresser. During my research, I kept hitting dead ends with Joe, and it might be because according to birth and death records, his name was actually Dennis, but he went by his middle name. In November of 1993, Joe was 32 years old, a former Navy man. His obituary notes that he died in May of 1999 at the age of 38. He was also joined at the apartment that night by his then-boyfriend, Stephen Chafee, who also worked as a hairdresser. Then there was Joe's brother, Tim, who was joined at the party by his then-boyfriend, a man named Samuel. Then there was the third brother, Jeff Schaefer, who was 34 years old in 93 and has also since passed away. Beyond these men, there was John Riker, 42 years old at the time. He was 15 years older than Kathy and also her former boyfriend, who many allege was both controlling and violently abusive. So you might see how Kathy might have felt comfortable attending this party. Her hairdresser's there, along with his two brothers. There's two boyfriends and John Riker. According to what's initially reported, the group partied heavily. There was alcohol, prescription pills, marijuana, and reportedly Jeff brings a mountain of cocaine. The original story says they all hung out, partied, went to a few clubs, then returned to the apartment, at which time John and Kathy leave together. Riker tells authorities that he drives Kathy to her car, she follows him back to his house, and they spend the night. He then claims that early Sunday morning around 6 a.m., He gets a call from one of his employees and has to leave. He comes back to the house at 8.30 and Kathy and her car are both gone. This is the story he sticks to for years. And because none of the men at the party are willing to contradict him, the police can't directly prove he's lying, even though his story sounds like bullshit. However, things change in late 99 and early 2000 when Sergeant Van takes over the case. In just a few months, he manages to gather more evidence and information than had been obtained in the previous seven years, seemingly supporting the family's belief that the original investigators didn't care about this case, or at least didn't try very hard. Regardless, two of the men present at the party changed their stories. By the process of elimination, we know it can't be Joe because he dies in mid-99. We know it can't be Riker or Jeff because they never changed their stories. That leaves Tim... Steve, and Sam, and there's a big part of me that doubts Tim would flip on his brothers, so it's probably the two boyfriends who speak up years later when they're no longer connected to these men. According to Van, he's told that the group all went out to a local bar, they saw a fight between Kathy and Riker, and he slapped her in the face. Not wanting to deal with the drama, Tim, Steve, Joe, and Sam hop in a cab and travel a few miles away to a popular gay club on Massachusetts Avenue. This leaves Kathy in the company of John Riker, who apparently just slapped her, and then there's Jeff Schaefer as well. What exactly happens between these three over the course of the next few hours has never been revealed. When again we pick up the story, the group of men have returned from the club and arrived back at Joe's apartment. They state one of two different versions of the story, 
Either Kathy enters the bathroom and falls unconscious, or when they come in, Kathy's already laying unconscious in the shower and Riker's trying to wake her. Either way, it's pretty clear Kathy's incapacitated. Whether this is from an overdose, accidental, or forced, or for some other reason, we're not sure. Now, at this time, Kathy's wrapped in a blanket and carried out into the living room. Then, all of the people present get together and agree that they're never going to talk about what happened here tonight. At this time, allegedly, Jeff and John carry Kathy out to the car and load her into it. They then both get in and drive away. Supposedly, around two hours later, Jeff returns by himself and Kathy's never seen again. Whether or not there was any conversation or discussion about what had happened has never been stated. All of this apparently happens around 5 a.m., and with the two-hour window, it would seemingly stretch to sometime between 7 and 7.30, fitting in nicely with when Riker claims to have left his house that morning. Riker's home in Greenwood is 26 miles southwest from the apartment complex, and according to Google Maps, would take around 35 minutes to drive. Jeff Schaefer's home was then in the town of Hope and was just over 53 miles from the complex, taking an apparent 58 minutes to drive. Putting all of the relative data in, for someone to leave the complex, drive to the restaurant, grab Kathy's car, go to Riker's house, then go to Schaefer's house and back to the complex, it would take over two and a half hours, assuming they were moving quick. However, if you cut out the stop at the restaurant and the stop at Riker's house, you have a total round trip of two hours and three minutes from the apartment complex to Schaefer's home and hope back to the apartment complex. This makes it entirely possible that the two men could have driven straight to Schaefer's home in close proximity to Schaefer Lake. Now, I've always been under the impression that the reason Jeff went along was because Riker couldn't dispose of the body and get Kathy's car by himself. So maybe Jeff drives the car, or Riker does, and they head straight down to his house and hope. Well, if that's the case, then there's plenty of time to dispose of the body and make it back to the apartment. I also think it's worth noting that while it's said Jeff returned around two hours later, that word around is probably doing some heavy lifting. We've got to keep in mind these accounts are being given by people who just spent the previous few hours partying and getting high as hell, so their perception of time might not be super accurate. At the same time, a lot of different things could have been done. They could have driven almost anywhere inside 30 to 40 miles from the apartment complex and dumped or buried or submerged Kathy in her car. Generally speaking, when someone disappears and their vehicle is also gone, you're often looking at cases where people have gone into the water, whether accidentally or as the result of foul play. It seems most likely in this case, since Kathy's car has never been found, that she and the vehicle are probably together. This leads many, including Kathy's family, to believe it's very likely that she could have been dumped into Schaefer Lake, which covers more than 100 acres. Unfortunately, due to the private ownership arrangement of the area, no searches have been conducted because all of the owners must agree. Of course, all these years later, you can't help but wonder if new owners might have a different view than these folks had back in the 2000s. For the most part, almost everyone who has analyzed this case believes there are at least two people who know exactly what happened to Kathy, Jeff Schaefer and John Riker. Schaefer's gone. He can't answer any more questions. Riker, though, is in his 70s and today is living down in Florida. Despite the changing of stories and the contradictory information given to investigators, Riker has never changed his story and continues to maintain that he brought Kathy home to his house and that she left the next morning of her own volition. A story that pretty much no one believes. But there's a little bit more. Allegedly, one of the men at the party that night told investigators that Joe Schaefer, the man who owned the apartment, was really struggling with what had happened. He knew Kathy, and he knew her mother, and he wasn't sure he could continue on without speaking up. Allegedly, in response to this, John Riker showed up at his job and the two were involved in a verbal altercation during which time it was made exceedingly clear to Joe what would happen if he decided to talk. It's worth noting that neither Joe nor Jeff seemingly had anything to say about Kathy 
even when they were on their deathbeds. For me, at least, in my own opinion, it's not really a question of what happened per se. Even the family have come to accept that Kathy didn't make it out of that apartment alive. The real question here is how exactly did things go? Did Kathy, partying perhaps a little too much, accidentally overdose and then everyone at the party freaked out and decided to get rid of the body? Was she maybe coerced or forced into ingesting more drugs and alcohol than she wanted and thereby was murdered through a method of purposeful overdose? Then again, you have to ask yourself, how do we know she overdosed at all? If Riker did strike her that night and the history of abuse was legit, then how do we know he didn't take it too far and ended up killing her? There are many methods he could have employed that wouldn't have left recognizable marks on the body, at least not as obvious as gunshots or stab wounds. People saw her in a blanket. They didn't check her pulse. They didn't try to revive her. That, to me, speaks volumes about the fact that there could not have been any doubt at the time that Kathy was dead. So, why don't you bring her to an emergency room and leave her there? Why don't you throw her out on a street corner and call 911 or leave her in a field somewhere to be found? Hell, why not bring her back to her own car, throw her inside, pour some drugs in there, and make it look like she OD'd? If this were a group of teenagers or younger folks, I could buy that they were afraid and just wanted to get rid of her. But that's not the case. They're all using drugs. They're all partying. This isn't their first rodeo. To me, the only reason you go to such lengths to hide the body, to eliminate the car, to threaten and persuade others to keep their mouths shut is because this was no accident. Kathy was murdered, and they knew if she was found, they could swing for it. That's the only way any of this makes any sense to me. And even then, you have to wonder, all these years later, half the people present are dead now. What stops someone from coming forward? Police have made it clear there are unlikely to be any charges. The family would love to see justice done, but they'd also accept the opportunity to grieve and seek some form of closure by bringing Kathy home and laying her to rest. All it would take is one call, one anonymous text or email, and you could help raise a veil that has haunted a family for more than 30 years. Her parents lost their lives without ever knowing the truth and her sisters continue to grow older, struggling to accept the likelihood that they too may never know for sure, but they refuse to give up. Surely, someone out there knows where Kathy is. Whether you were at the party that night, or you've heard the story over the years, people like this don't tend to keep their mouths shut. Surely, someone possesses the truth, and one day, come hell or high water, it's going to come out. Whether it's a massive search conducted by the state police or a couple of guys diving into the lake to check for Kathy and her car, you can't hold the tide back forever. But if you know something, if you've lost someone in your life, if you have felt grief and pain at someone else's absence, then you need to seek out the courage it takes to tell someone the truth about Kathy. All of that pain, that grief, the nightmares, the trauma, the horror is all on those who could alleviate this family's pain and choose not to because unless someone comes forward or new information is found, the vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry, there are many forums and news websites discussing her case. For this episode, the two most prominent news sources were the Daily Journal and the Indianapolis Star. I would also highly recommend checking out Darlene's interview on the Unfound podcast, and I'll provide a link to that episode in the show notes. If you have any information about the vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry, please contact the Indiana State Police at 317-899-8508. You can also contact Crime Stoppers of Central Indiana at 317-262-TIPS. That's 317-262-TIPS. 
317-262-8477. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod, email me at TraceEvidencePod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Just a quick reminder, if you're planning to attend CrimeCon this year in Nashville from May 31st through June 2nd, use promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com to save 10% on your pass. That's promo code TRACE at CrimeCon.com. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers, without whom Trace Evidence would not be possible. A massive thank you to Andrew Guarino, Anne M. Bertram, Camelia Tyler, Christine Greco, Danny Renee, Denise Dingsdale, Desiree Lauro, Donna Buttram, Diani Dyson, Jennifer Winkler, Justin Snyder, Kara Moreland, KY, Lars Jensen Fangel, Leslie B, Lisa Hobson, Madison Lahoulier, Melissa Brekhuizen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Ruth, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Tom Radford, and Wend Organ. I want to thank you all so much for your support. It means the world to me, and you are truly the lifeblood of this podcast. If you're interested in supporting the show and listening to your episodes ad-free, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence or click the support option on the official website at trace-evidence.com. This concludes our look into the vanishing of Lola Catherine Fry a case that I believe is extremely solvable and I hope we'll see some updates on sooner than later. Before leaving you today, I just wanted to apologize for my absence these past few weeks. To make a long story short, my computer died, HP won't honor the warranty, so I ordered a new computer, it arrived broken, and then I had to order another one and send the broken one back. Basically, I've spent the past three weeks either waiting for computers to arrive or arguing with companies about them. Thankfully, things seem to be back on track now, so I truly appreciate your kindness and patience, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.